Hello and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service as we gather to worship and glorify our Father in heaven. May all praise, honor, and glory be unto him in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We hope you will be both enlightened and edified by today's lesson. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Good to see your smiling faces. Everything is getting back to normal. Makes us realize how important small things are in our lives, like electricity. Makes things, it affects us. But we're thankful for your presence. If you're visiting with us, we would encourage you to fill out a visitor's card and leave it on the seat there where you're at, and you'll be picked up later. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this, the morning. We're thankful for the many blessings that you give to us each day, and the opportunity that we have together as your people. We ask your blessings on this time, and we pray that every act of our worship collectively and individually will be pleasing to you. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Our first song this morning will be number 134, number one, three, four. Encamped along the hills of mighty Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle where the night shall pale the glowing skies. Yeah. 
bow with me as we go to God in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, to you be the glory in all things, because you are the great I am. Father, thank you for your love to us, your mercy, especially your grace that you were able to send Christ Jesus to us, that we might have Christ in our lives for the redemption of of salvation in life. Father, we come this morning to praise your name and to glorify you. We that do that with songs that remind us of a sacrificed yet risen Savior for all mankind. Father, we sing of a, of a hope of a land far away that when our lives are over here, we'll go into the next phase of that life where our true home is. Father, thank you for the written word that you have given us. It guides us. It guides us through life, and it can be a comfort to us in times of crisis. It can be a solace to us in times of sickness. And it can uplift us and encourage us when we're down. Father, be with us as toils and tribulations come into our lives. Be with those that have been displaced during this hurricane. Father, we understand that this is the seasons. This is what happens when Things disrupt us. But Father, always let us focus on you and your son, Jesus Christ, because that is the true way. Thank you for the word that you have given us, that we can gain knowledge from that word and we, we can have a greater wisdom, a better understanding of this life. And through this, we can grow closer to you as we serve you in the church. Thank you for the wisdom of this church. We realize that sin needed a Savior. And Father, thank you for these people that assembled with us this morning. And in churches all throughout the world that put you first in their lives, that they have the same goals, the same agendas, the same hope, and a common bond of love that each and every one of us have. Father, we strive to do good in this world. Be with us when we do good. Give us that providential care to watch over us. We're thankful, Father, that we have elders in this congregation that can shepherd this flock, that they can help guide us. Thank you for the deacons, for all of those wives that work with them for preachers and their wives, and preachers throughout this, this country and the world that bring Christ to people by their lives. Father, thank you for Bible class teachers. People, people that, thank you, Father, for people that help keep us strong in the faith. For those that serve without being seen, 
Thank you for parents of children that those children can see that they put you first in our in their life. And Father, we ask you to be with those freedom fighters in this world that help protect us, that will save us when we need saved. We pray for those that are sick this morning, Father, those that may be suffering. Impossible, ask that you return them to their health, that they can once again be back with us each and every service. Father, we see the reflection of Christ in people, those that do good. We see that hope of glory, and thank we thank for, for things like faith, hope, and love that can overshadow a lost and dying world. And for Jesus, our Redeemer, our example, he is the epitome of of, of, of perfection, which our lives revolve around. Father, we realize that sometimes we do let sin enter our lives, and we ask forgiveness for all of that. And go with us now as we continue our worship to you, our only true and living God. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Number 707. 707.
If you would like to mark our invitation song, it will be number 755, number 755. And at this time, before Brother Mitchell brings the message from God's Word, we'll sing number 585. 585. Soldiers of Christ, It is certainly good to see each of you today. I'm sorry for the difficulty that has befallen our area, but as those storms go, I think we could all say that we uh, did well, and we'll get it cleaned up, and we'll just go right on living life, serving the Lord till He calls us home. But it is good to be back home. It's good to be with family. We I treasure those times more than uh, you want to hear about or I have the power to tell. In John 15, verses 4 and 9, John writes, Abide in me, and I in you, quoting Jesus. Abide in me, and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you yourselves abide in me. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Then John 8, verses 31 and 32. He writes, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus uh, demands for life. Uh, are just that their demands. And they, they, it does not call for a single decision 
to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Those are imperatives. Those are things that must be done. But there's more to it, a lot more to it. Jesus demands that we be engaged, our minds and our hearts uh, be fully engaged and be governed in the way that we live our lives. A covenant with Jesus in the past that has no impact in the way I conduct myself now and in the future is a false covenant. It has become, at the very, uh, at, at least, a voided covenant. And one should go back and revisit that. When Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, in John 8, verse 31, the converse is equally true. If you do not abide in my word, you are not one of my disciples. So that is what we become if we count on past experiences without ongoing devotion to the Lord. We're not disciples, not in any real sense of that word. The Lord demands a continuing lifelong encounter with him. One way Jesus taught the necessity of ongoing devotion was to utter these words. Abide in me. There's nothing uniquely religious about the word that's translated abide in the language of the New Testament. It is the ordinary word for stay or continue, sometimes dwell. Jesus meant stay in me. Continue in me. Keep me as your spiritual dwelling. And the context of his demand uses the analogy of a vine with its branches. Jesus compares himself to the vine, as you've heard read, and the disciples to the branches. Look at John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This analogy helps us understand what Jesus is getting at, what he what he's means by abide in him. And the main point is that the power to bear fruit, that is the power to live a fruitful Christ-like life, flows from Jesus if we remain attached to him. And it is very much like a branch attached to a vine. And the life-sustaining sap, the fruit-producing sap, can flow to that branch. And as long as that's not disrupted, it will prosper and do well. But if it is cut off, if it's in some way disrupted, then it's going to die. Jesus explicitly here is claiming to be the essential power the necessary power for us to become fruitful in this service, to become genuine disciples of Christ. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Abiding in Jesus means staying connected to the life-giving vine, which is Christ. He is the moment-by-moment -moment cause of every good thing that happens. It's not like he, as great as that was in the beginning, created all that is and has just abandoned it. He has since that time, moment by moment, been the source of every good thing. And he demands recognition as the moment by moment cause for every good thing. He wants to be recognized for who he is. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing? Really? Well, we could uh, sin and cease to bear fruit and perish without him, is, is what he's saying. Abiding in Jesus means maintaining this connection with the mind of God, hour by hour, to the one, the connection to the one who by himself or who alone is the source of all that's good, all that's noble, all that's honorable. You know, it was he who said, 
Whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. Uh, and so here we are. When you abide, you bear fruit. And the fruit bearing and the commandment keeping results from ob abiding in Christ. The fruit bearing and commandment keeping shows clearly the one in whom we abide, the one from whom we take our direction. And Jesus uh, said in John 15 and verse 5, whoever abides in me bears much fruit. And so we are involved in a, a process that will be ongoing until we leave this world. The point is to discover how to bear the fruit that he requires from his people. The short answer is for one to abide always in Jesus. So the question becomes, okay, so how do we abide in Jesus always? What does it mean in actual life experience to abide in Jesus? What are you talking about? And uh, he uses two more phrases that point to the answer to the question. He refers to abiding in his love in John 15 and verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And he also refers to abiding in his word. Both of those, abiding in his love and abiding in his word, both point to staying as one who is continually trusting the truth of Jesus' words and certainly trusting in the validity and the truth of Jesus' love. Abiding means trusting in what Jesus' love is, that it's there, that it's present, and that we trust that. When you consider your circumstances, some people are being persecuted for the faith. Some people are battling with disease, and not necessarily because of the faith, but it's befallen. Others suffer from abandonment by their peers, maybe by their family. And so they conclude sometimes, well, Jesus doesn't ever love me. He doesn't love me anymore. That's the opposite of abiding in his love. The fact that these trials and tribulations have arrived, he told us we'd have those things. In this world, you'll have those things. But abiding means to trust Jesus when you consider uh, your circumstances that we've indicated, and their negative circumstances. Be assured that God's still there. He still cares. Abiding in his love means to continue to believe moment by moment that we are loved. We don't understand, I don't, everything that happens, and you don't either, or why everything happens as it does, and particularly those things that, that are hurtful and painful. But God understands. Everything that's entering our lives, his sovereign authority is part of his love for us. And if it's pleasant, he says in Matthew 6, beginning at verse 26, that's how my father cares for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. How much more for you? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor garner into barns. Your heavenly father feeds them. And uh, are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. Not even one. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is cut down and thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? If what comes is pleasant, that's his response. If what comes is painful, he says, uh, Matthew 10, verse 28, he says, fear not, the worst you know that can happen is death, and I will, I've overcome death. And I'll help you overcome it. Do not fear those who kill the body, he said, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him, respect him, revere him, 
who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you always, even in the end of the age. And then one in John 11, verse 25 and 6, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he asked her, do you believe this? I ask you, do you believe it? In Luke 14, 14, the gospel writer has this, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So abiding in Jesus means to, to abide all the while trusting in his love for us. That, that is, it means living on this truth. Moment by moment, it flows to us like the life-giving sap comes from the vine to the branch. We receive it. We get life from it, spiritual life from it every day. Abiding in Christ means trusting in his word. Uh, the truth, uh, this truth occurs with the phrase, abide in my word. John 8 and verse 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So that's, that's not a complex concept. If you continue my word, that's the condition. If that takes place, then you'll be truly my disciples. Keep on trusting my word. Keep trusting what I have revealed to you about myself about my Father, about my work, about the work that we are to do together. The result of abiding in Jesus' word is being set free. And you shall know the truth, John 8 verse 32 says, and the truth shall make you free. So free from what? Free from sin. That's the slavery that Jesus had in mind. John 8 and verse 34, he said, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. You know, if, if you're going to live that lifestyle, you're going to make that choice, and you're going to go out there in the far country and abide there, then there, this is the consequence. You will allow yourself to be enslaved, and you won't be in charge of your own life and existence. If you abide in my word, he said the truth will set you free. Not sinning is a fruit of abiding in the word. You know, if we or in that book, and that book is increasingly in us, we will avoid so many difficulties, so many hurts, so many painful things that we have all struggled with. We, we conclude abiding Jesus in his love and in his word is trusting that he really does love us every moment of every day. And Everything he revealed about himself and his work for us and our future with him is true. That's what abiding Jesus meant. So he tells the disciples, I want you to abide and I want you to hear me. In uh, Matthew, uh, Mark, sorry, verse 7 and verse 14. After he called the crowd to him, he began saying to them, listen to me. All of you who understand, listen to me. You, you can hear, even regurgitate what you've heard, and, and come away with no understanding, no concept whatsoever, and, and unchanged. People do it all the time. In Luke 8, in verse 8, the text says, and he said these things, he would call out, he has ears, as he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I don't know about you, but there were times that I received admonition from my dad most of the time where he would say, do you hear me talking to you, boy? Now, he didn't mean just letting it fly by. He meant that needs to stick in that head. And I need for you to do or not to do, as the case might have been, what I'm telling you. I need for you to hear. I need for you to, to use that gift. Luke 8, 18, so take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. 
Whoever does not have even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. The entire life and work of Jesus is one great argument for why we need to hear his word. We need to listen to what he says page after page after page of the New Testament Gospels pile up reason to turn off the television and to listen to Jesus. To get off the screen, uh, man, I've been in the airport recently. Have you ever noticed how many people are just... <laughs> I don't know how they get where they're going, but they never look up. I work at a screen every day. I'm uh, struggling with tech neck. And so I, I understand. But, but there's times to turn some of that stuff off because the programming that's there does not represent the mind of God. And if you stay in that world, then that's, that's where you're going to be in your thinking. And that's not help. Listen because no one else ever spoke like Jesus spoke. You know, pay careful and close attention to, to what he has to say. Jesus was so astonishing and so threatening to his adversaries because they, they didn't want anybody coming in making any corrections. They liked it just like it was. But they wanted him out of the way, and so they sent officers to arrest him. John 7, verse 32 says, The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priest, the Pharisees, sent officers to seize him. But to their surprise and their utter dismay, the officers returned with no Jesus, empty-handed, not because Jesus was protected by ninjutsu warrior bodyguards or something like that, but because his teaching was stunning. The words he spoke were overwhelming. Look at John 7, 45 and 6. The officers then came to the chief priests, Pharisees, and said to them, what they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered and said, never man has spoken the way this man speaks. When they listened to Jesus, they could not, they did not execute their orders to arrest this just man. Jesus speaks the very words of God. No man ever spoke like him because he speaks the very words of God. When the Lord finished the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 9, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes, the Pharisees. Because indeed he had all authority. The, this authority was not the result of a personality trait. And it wasn't the result of a unique teaching technique that he learned in college. Even though those are quite useful. But it's much, much deeper than that. His words carry power and authority because, as Jesus notes, they are the words of God. John 12 and verse 49 says, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment so as what to say and what to speak. Verse 50, I know that his commandment is eternal life, therefore the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. John 14, 24, And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And so he spoke the words of the very God. Jesus' words have authority because whenever he speaks, God is speaking. Jesus speaks from God the Father uh, as God the Son. Jesus' words silence Supernatural force is another reason to listen to it. Uh, you get all kinds of interesting discussions and some not so interesting, all kinds of debates. But there are sinister forces out there. And the words of Jesus defeats them every time. His words carry that much force and that much authority to overwhelmed supernatural forces. Once when Jesus met a demon-possessed man, 
Nobody else has been able to help him. Jesus rebuked the demon. He said, be silent and come out of him. Mark 1, verse 25. There's a Jewish fellow that whose sons tried that one time. The demon jumped on them and whipped them severely. But when Jesus spoke, it was gone. When the demon violently convulsed the man, while coming forth, the crowd was astonished, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So the power of Jesus' word is unlimited. His word healed leprosy. Matthew chapter 8, verse 31. His words restored people's hearing in Mark 7, 34 and 5. And the words he uttered cured people of blindness. Matthew chapter 9, verses 28 and 30. So on his word, the raging sea was calm. Mark 4, verse 39 through 41. We went out into the Cape of uh, the bay, and that was last year, and the, the seas were five to eight feet, I'd say. And for people that are not used to being on the water, that's probably a pretty significant challenge. And I, I, remember, I remember some of those young men that were strutting around there initially were then at the stern, sick. And, uh, of course, anybody can get motion sickness. Uh, there's no shame in that. But if, if they hadn't been strutting so much beforehand, it wouldn't have been as funny as it was. Uh, but... We can get out of balance and not recognize who we're dealing with sometimes. I I don't know what I would have done if I'd have been on that boat and Jesus came out and spoke and calmed the sea and said, Peace, be still, be quiet. And immediately the water's like glass. On his word, the raging sea was calm. And most remarkable of all, with a simple word, on three recorded occasions, Jesus raised the dead, brought them back to life. In Mark 9, 41 and 42, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately, they were completely astonished. In Luke 7, verses 14 and 15, he came up and touched the coffin. And the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. One other, John 11, 43 and 44. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Bound hand and foot with wrappings and his face wrapped around with cloth, Jesus said to him, to them, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus lived again. One that speaks as no other ever had. One that speaks the words of the very God. One that speaks and overcomes supernatural forces and death itself deserves to be heard because Jesus, who thus spoke, has the words of eternal life. Jesus' words were life in more ways than one. They could sustain and restore physical health, but more importantly, they reveal the only way, the one way, the only way to life eternal. It is a wonderful thing, wonderful thing to be raised dead, but not if you're simply going to perish later in torment. The most precious thing about the words of Jesus, the most important reason to listen to him is that his words will lead to eternal life. 
Once when Jesus finished teaching some hard things, many of the disciples turned back and they no longer walked with him. And Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Do you want to go away as well? You want to leave too? To which Peter responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? King James Bible says, Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 6, 66 through 8. This was a lot more than enthusiasm for a charismatic teacher. Much more. Jesus confirmed Peter's judgment. He said, It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Peter is correct. Jesus, the words of eternal life. Everyone who wants it alive, must listen, listen to the words of the Savior. Now, you're not obligated to listen to my words, but as I bring to you a word from God, you're obligated to listen to that, and I am too. Jesus' words produce faith. In Romans 10, verse 17, the text says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In the parable of the soils, Jesus speaks of four types of soil. The seed representing the word of God is sown in these various types of soil. One type of soil is the trampled path where the seed falls and the birds come and snatch it away. Jesus explains after this fashion, Luke 8, verse 11, the ones along the path of those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Jesus sees the word as the key to believing and receiving salvation. And if you allow that word to be taken away from you, there will be no faith in Jesus. There will be no salvation. And there'll be no eternal life at the end of this life. First comes the hearing of the word. Then comes faith in Jesus. And then comes eternal life. In John 5 and verse 24, John writes, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, has passed out of death into life. Jesus' words awaken faith because they reveal who he really is and what he does to obtain eternal life for us. We see in Jesus the, the glory and the all-sufficiency of his work through his word. That's how we encounter that. But not everybody sees. Some hear the words, but they don't hear them. It's true and compelling. They don't take them to heart. Jesus said in Matthew 13 and 13, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they, because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. They weren't willing to, to reach out and grasp. It. When Jesus was on trial, Pilate pressed him to confess, and he that he claimed to be king of the Jews. And so Jesus responds to him in John 18 and verse 37. Pilate therefore says to him, so you're a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Everyone. Pilate responded cynically in John 18, 38, what is true? There was no place in Pilate for Jesus' word. On the one hand, there were people whose hearts and minds have no room for the words of Jesus, and on the other hand, there are people who are receptive to the truth. Which are you? All of us have to answer that question for ourselves. Which are you? Jesus calls those who have a place for truth his sheep. In John 10 and verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, 
and I know them, and they follow me. We know we are his sheep if we listen to his words. We know we are his sheep if there is a truth-shaped place for his word in our hearts, and we welcome what he said. On my Lord's behalf, I would urge everybody here, and especially those that are not in covenant with him, to hear him. Listen to his words. Do not turn away from the Father's command on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. When Peter uh, got excited and wanted to build a tabernacle, for Elijah and for Moses as well as Jesus. And the Lord, the Father, said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Do not miss the merciful attraction within these words. Matthew 13, 31. Uh, Mark, I'm sorry, 13, 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. Do not hate yourself Rejecting the one who said in John chapter 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that your joy may be full. Abide in Christ. Hear Christ. Always. If you're here today and you've been thinking on spiritual matters, I hope that represents all of us. I know it does. But it may be that there is a need that you have. And we don't know about it, but you do, and the Lord does. And if you want the church to enter into prayer on your behalf as a Christian, it doesn't have to be a sin problem. It may be some other burden that you bear. If you feel a need for that kind of support, then you come and let that be known, and we'll pray for you. We'll be honored to do that. And if you're not in Christ, don't throw your soul away. Don't throw your eternity away. If you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, then repent and turn away from sin. Why? Because he said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. And then, as a penitent believer, be willing to confess your faith in him before men. Again, because this is what he requires. And finally, consent to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins and rise up to walk in a new life. We're here to help you if you'll just let us as together we stand and sing. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over all the earth. And the roll is called the country, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called the country, when the roll is called the country, when the roll is called the
Be seated, please. To help us to prepare our minds for the taking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 726. Number 726. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Paul talking there said, what is the conclusion? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. We all understand that when we worship in spirit, and in truth, that means we worship with our minds. We, can, we concentrate on what we're, what we're singing, the prayers, 
the Bible lesson. And we use the truth in the Word of God, His Word, to base how we do that. As we come to this time in our worship service to remember Jesus' death on the cross, to remember His perfect life, to remember His resurrection, as we come to this time, we also are to do this with the Spirit and with the understanding, to focus our minds on the suffering that, that Jesus did for us, the love that he had for us, to proclaim that he will come again, as Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, to examine ourselves so that we might partake in a worthy manner. As we do this, let's focus our mind on these things. Will you pray with me, please? Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for your love for us, that you loved us enough to send your Son to this earth to give us a perfect example and then to willingly give his life for us, Father. Father, as we think on these things, as we partake of this bread that represents his body that hung on that cross, help us, Father, to examine ourselves and partake in a way that's pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Father, again, we approach your throne, thanking you for your love for us. Father, we at this time pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood that he shed for our sins, that we'll do so in a way pleasing in your sight. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, we'll have a prayer for our contribution. As most of you know, there's a box in the foyer, and you can place your contribution in there on your way out. Would you pray with me, please? Our God and our Father, again, we thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Father, we thank you for all the physical blessings that you bless us with. We thank you for the fact that you allow us to work and to accumulate funds to, to live on. Father, at this time, as we give back that portion that we've purposed in our hearts, we pray that you'll help us, that we may be cheerful givers. We pray that these funds will be used to build up your cause here and elsewhere, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let me encourage everyone to come back tonight at 6, and let's be together again. Uh, you know, these... When these storms come along, I think about different ones that we were in, and when you walk out of that much disaster and you're not hurt, you're not physically harmed in some way, that certainly ought to bring a season of thanksgiving. It's material things uh, that can be replaced. But the preciousness of the gift of life, that's, that's truly valuable. Let's be standing for dismiss. Lord, God, our Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today with friends, family, and especially people of your faith. We thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you for the great lesson we've had. We just pray, Lord, that we can take it to heart and take it home with us. We just ask you to go with us. We pray for those of our family cannot be here. We pray for their welfare and their, their, that you just watch over them and guide them and protect them. 
We'd ask you this morning, Lord, to go with us, guide and protect us, be part of our lives, and help us to be better Christians. And all of thee, this we would ask in your son's name, Jesus. Please, Lord, be with us, guide us, and protect us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is well.